Let's open our Bible this morning to begin. Look at Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read a couple verses. Or if you have your bulletin, it's on the back of your bulletin this morning. Today's scripture reading to begin our service. We're glad you're here. And hopefully you were able to come a little bit early and uh, get uh, some breakfast this morning. And uh, it sounded like there was uh, a lot of fellowship people talking. And that's always good. And uh, somebody said, I'm going to need to preach quick so that nobody falls asleep after muffins and sausage and whatever else you had, but hopefully you enjoyed that this morning. Matthew chapter 1, if you would, look at uh, verse 21, and uh, we're of course in the Christmas season and be thinking about this thought this morning. I'll read the first two verses and then we can all read verse number 23 together. Matthew chapter 1, I'll start in verse 21, you join in on verse 23. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying altogether, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall call forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Aren't you glad this morning that God came to be with us? He lives in us through his Holy Spirit, and we will dwell with him eternally. Let's thank him for that. Lord, you are good and gracious to us. And uh, you came uh, to this earth and you lived, took on human form. And uh, we come today and these next few days as the Christmas season is here. We come to celebrate that, to uh, join our hearts with those of uh, hundreds and, and even thousands of years ago that waited your arrival. And we rejoice with them that you kept your promise to come and to dwell among us, to live a perfect life on our behalf, and then to die and to raise to new life so that we could be resurrected with you. And so we thank you this morning that you have done that. And so we pray that you will keep our minds and hearts focused on that in these next few days and that it would impact us and change us to become more like you. Lord, as we open your word this morning to view your love that you display to us. May we also be loving. May you forgive us of our sins and our failings of the week that we bring even this morning before you, knowing that uh, we are uh, discouraged by them and we are uh, upset by them and we repent of them. And now we turn to your grace and ask that you would move and work in us. Help us to move past them and to find your love redeeming in us this morning. We pray for those that are hurting today, those of our church that have had loss even this week, and we ask that you would give them special comfort, whether in the service today or wherever they may be from your word. And uh, we ask that you would guide and direct. Help as we sing, as we pray, to glorify you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, and look at 1 John chapter 4, and we'll read there in just a moment. And as you find your place there, you can take a look at your bulletin for today as well, a number of things coming up that we'll draw your attention to and some announcements that we'll make. So find your place in the book of 1 John. We've been taking a break from the book of Matthew for a couple weeks here at Christmas, and then at the new year, we'll go back and pick back up and... Matthew chapter 13, and if you would there, 1 John chapter 4. And then if you would, notice on your bulletin a few things coming up this week and uh, that we are ways that we're celebrating Christmas around uh, the church in the coming days. Tonight, uh, there's a Christmas music celebration. There's a number of people in our church that have prepared instrumental songs and uh, vocal songs, soloist choir, and a number of things, a uh, number of Christmas songs, and we'll be gathered together tonight at 5 o'clock here in the auditorium. There's no kids' classes or adult group tonight, uh, but just that uh, music celebration that'll be this evening. I hope you'll plan and come and be a part of that enjoyable night together, and I know a lot of people have put in some hard work on those things, and that's this evening. Uh, this Wednesday, our midweek service is given over to our candlelight service for this year, and you notice the time is a little different. It's at 6.30 that evening, a little earlier to give us some extra time at the end, but uh, that'll be 6.30 this Wednesday evening. 
Uh, we celebrate by singing Christmas carols together, scripture readings and Christmas readings alike, and uh, by candlelight as we finish. And then this year, a little different, we're going to have a cookie exchange at the end and some hot chocolate that's available for you. And we're just asking anybody that comes as part of our church to bring, uh, I don't know, a dozen or a couple dozen cookies. It can be, you notice they're store-bought or your uh, secret family recipe that you're making this week anyway, and bring those with you. And uh, we'll put them all out in the back. At the end, we'll have some bags, and you can uh, kind of kick off the Christmas days eating well with that cookie exchange. And then the special note there, wear your best Christmas sweater. And you can define best. It can be worst or best, uh, however you want to do that. Um, but just wear a uh, best Christmas sweater if you have one, and we'll celebrate that night. Then next week, our Christmas Day uh, celebration at 10 o'clock that morning. The service time is the same as normal. I hope you'll plan to come and be a part of that and celebrate uh, Christmas together as a, as a church family. Uh, that service will be a little different than normal. Uh, it'll be, it'll be a, a little bit briefer than normal because we'll have all the kids. Everybody will be all together in the service that morning. So bring your kids in with you and they'll sit with the family. Uh, we'll have some Christmas songs in a short uh, time in Scripture. And then also... Uh, having communion that day. It's a little different than maybe some on normal Christmas day, but in celebrating, uh, looking forward to the coming of Christ, coming again, and uh, taking communion that day as well. And then you see there, the note about January 1st. The scheduled time is the same for the morning, and then no, no kids or evening uh, clubs that night. And then if you would notice on the back this morning, a number of people that we are uh, praying for, and um, family of Grace Dowdy and her funeral was this week and just want to thank each of you for, uh, for being a part of that and uh, doing what you can to help the family throughout that and praying for uh, Brother Henry and his family uh, in the coming days and weeks. Then the family of John Dorsey, this is uh, Melissa Tigner and John Dorsey's uh, father. He passed away uh, a couple weeks ago and then the funeral will be... Um, uh, this Wednesday at Victory Baptist in, in Maryland. And you see the service time there. There's a viewing before it at 1030. And then uh, if you would notice at the bottom, uh, the family of Earl Sharon. Brother Earl went to be with the Lord this morning about 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, though our hearts are sorrowful for physical loss, and, and this is one of those times, and you see there's three different people that and families represented that we love and cherish that have experienced loss physically. Uh, but as Christians this morning, this is what we come together to proclaim and to declare, uh, that we trust the Lord, that he keeps his promise. In the same way that he kept his promise to send Jesus the first time, he keeps his promises to protect his own. And we know that Brother Earl and Miss Dowdy and um, Mr. Dorsey are in the presence of the Lord this morning. And so if you would uh, be in prayer for Gail. In these next days, it's been a, a long battle. He has not felt well for quite a long time and suffered with uh, dementia, but uh, he passed, she said, peacefully. I talked to her for a while this morning on the phone, and she said it's a, unusual because it's a, it's a weight that's relieved because he really was so sick. And to know that he was is made whole this morning is a wonderful thing. Uh, it says funeral arrangements to be announced. That's because he's speaking this morning to her. I can give those to you. Uh, that'll be this Tuesday. Uh, from 9 to 11 in the morning, there'll be a viewing here at the church, a visitation with family from 9 to 11 this Tuesday morning, and the funeral will follow immediately at 11 um, this Tuesday uh, morning, and she uh, planned to do that because of uh, the holiday and possible weather and different things, and uh, Brother Earl will be buried on Wednesday in Wise, North Carolina, and so uh, they tried to adjust that for those things, and so if you can plan to be a part of that, I know that would be an encouragement uh, to the Sharon family as well. All right, let's uh, look, if you would, at 1 John chapter number 4. We're just going to read two verses this morning. We will eventually buffer this a little bit with the verses before and after. But I want this to be the driving center of our text this th today as we... Look to this, we've been talking about words for our waiting, words for Advent, words as we not only celebrate Christmas and look back to the Lord, but as we uh, look forward to Him. Notice if you would, it says 
in verse number 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he, first, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Let's ask the Lord to help us, and we'll have one more song. Father, thank you for your word today, and bless it in our hearts and lives. And we rejoice in you, and we ask that you teach and grow us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, in your Bible again this morning, in 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter 4. These two verses this morning that we're going to focus on speak of, and you see it there at the front of your bulletin, our word for today is love. And um, as I was preparing, and we all have a different idea or a different sense of love, and when I say the word, you may think of very different things. In fact, that's part of our issue as a society and culture is we kind of have redefined love in a way or dumbed down the word sometimes because if I were to ask you this morning name some tell me something that you love and we went around the room we might have names of dogs and cats pizza types uh, different tv shows sports teams food uh, Christmas lights your truck stuff at home uh, a setting in, in being around family but you could also name your kids and your wife and so which one? Like if you can describe a burrito and your spouse with the same word, that's not good because uh, we've dumbed it down a little bit when we talk about love. Uh, but love that we're going to talk about this morning is the deepest sense of it. And love is defined by the Lord this morning in our text. And so if we would, if we look at 1 John chapter 4, now I could make a great illustration of love this morning. We have some in the room that have been married for uh, decades, numbers of years. And then we have others in the room. We have Mallory this morning, and I won't make her stand. She's engaged to Leroy Clyde. This, no, that's, that's not his name. His name is Noah. Mallory is now engaged to be married. And uh, we could go around and give Mallory tips about love this morning. And uh, you could say, number one, engagement is not marriage. You like a Christmas party. you got six months to return if you need to. <laughs> Uh, take it back. But no, he's a great guy, and they are planning on getting married this uh, summer here, and, and so we're looking forward to that. And as you think about love, though, you think about many different things. And this particular text is not, it's not a, a passage that we are often associated with in our minds as a Christmas text, like this is a Christmas passage, like Matthew 1 or Luke 1 and 2, but it does speak explicitly to the coming of Christ, the purpose of Jesus, the Son of God, and why He came in human form. And so notice, if you would, as we look to the passage, you don't see any mention of Joseph or Mary or the long trek to Bethlehem. There's no shepherds, there's no angels in the sky, no baby in a manger, uh, no magi that have traveled to give gifts to the newborn king. There is no element of the Christmas story here other than the love of God in sending His Son for us. And Christmas is a Christmas story. It's a wonderful story, but it is more than a story. It's more than an event that we look back to. It's the culmination of God expressing His love so strongly toward us. It is God displaying His love in sending His Son. And we've been talking about these words for our waiting, and we've talked about the significance of the Christmas season, Advent, which simply just means waiting for something expected to arrive. And people waited for centuries for Jesus to come and arrive, and now we wait for Jesus once again to return and to make all things right and new. And while we wait, there are promises and themes that God have, has given us for that waiting. We looked at Isaiah uh, 40 last week, and we talked about that he, he gives us comfort and that he renews us continually until that time. 
Wednesday night, we finished up a study in Habakkuk in which we talked about that we are to be longing for the Lord and that we should be rejoicing in Him all while waiting. And this morning, we're going to look back, but this is not a prophecy text looking forward to the Messiah, but rather, this is one of Jesus' disciples looking back at Jesus. And you see it again in verse number 9. Notice it says, In this was manifested the love of God. Manifest just means this is how God displayed it. This is how He showed it to us. And for John, who when he writes this, is nearing the end of his life. He's thinking back and he's remembering probably decades before now, by the time he writes this, he's remembering decades before the last time he saw Jesus in person raised to new life. And he says, God showed his love to us. And how did he do that? In that he sent his only begotten son into the world. So we're going to look at this love this morning. As Christians, we, of course, declare a consistent outlook on God as our creator, we consistently say that God is loving, and it's a primary thing that we preach and teach. God is love. It's from the very youngest, our kids class that's in the back, and we, we talk to them, and one of the first things we teach them is that God is love. But in actuality, this is kind of counter to a lot of the religions of the, throughout the, all of the history of mankind. You think about how some of the old uh, ancient religions or mythology or different things and how they viewed the forming of the world, that it was gods battling it out together and that certain things were done in our world because of the battles of the gods or the violence that ensued. And there's, there's all these other sorts of ideas about deity or about God or about gods. But our, our thought about God, that he is love, it's actually very different than many of the religions of the world. Many of the religions of the world define their God as uh, describing them as prideful, describing them as mighty, describing them in terms of war, deceit, greed, enlightenment, even sexuality, and the general concept, but they don't focus typically on love as a characteristic of God. And I think that that's interesting as to why, because apart from the actual true God and the display of his Son, Jesus Christ, it would be difficult to reconcile that your God or that your deity had any love toward you at all. There's no hope, there's no joy, there's no rejoicing apart from Him. And love, true love, is only found and displayed in God. Notice, as we look again at 1 John in a moment, it tells us that we can and should love out of God's love. In fact, human beings can't gain their full capacity to love unless it is rooted and sourced in God's love. Humans can experience forms of love as a form of all these common graces that God gives to all mankind in general. We can experience love and we can love people and we can have feelings of love without having a real relationship with God, but that love eventually is going to be incomplete. and In a way, it's going to be misdirected without Him. People can even deny God or hate God and still experience love and forms of love in this world. But you cannot actually know real, true love unless you experience the love that God bestows upon mankind. Even beginning to define love can be difficult. As we mentioned, we sort of dumbed the word down this morning. If I said, what do you love? And you wrote it down, even, even on your own list, the 10 or 12 things that you would list it, it, there would be different types and different feelings, different elements to it. And we can have elements of love in many different things, in others, in people, in life, in experience, in stuff, in romance, in family. We can have it all, all these things. But in the same way that you can, you can exist as a human being, you can live as a person, but not be alive in your spirit until redeemed and saved by God. You can exist in life, but not live without God. And in the same way that human beings can exist and live, but not be made alive through Christ, you can know of love, but not really know love deeply without the love that we see bestowed on us from our Creator. All the things in this world that give us a hint of love they're meant to stir us 
to help us to understand in a better way the true love that is only found in the human soul between the soul and the Creator. If the things of this world are an end for us, then there's a dead end road there. It's emptiness that you come to. If you can say, well, I love, and you can fill in the blank, or I have, fill in the blank, I have a spouse, I have family, I have uh, success, I have riches, I have this, I have that, I have these things, fill in the blank, but I don't have Christ, then that's all that you have. And there's an end of that. But only in Christ do we experience His true love. There's so many good things that God gives us, and we even love some of them. The Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from above, and they're meant to steer us to worship Him. Even your family and the love you experience with your spouse and your children, your parents, your grandparents, that is that the love that is there in that relationship is meant to steer us toward a sense of God's love, the greatest love displayed on us. The things in life that we grow strongly toward or that we attach ourselves to, they're meant to steer us to the worship of God. Even the Christmas feasting that you will have this week and the celebration that you have, those are good things meant to direct your heart to worship God, the only thing that fulfills the human soul. And in this passage, we have this declaration of love from God. You say, well, how, what does this passage have to do with Christmas? Well, notice that two times in two verses, it references why and how God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, for us. Now, we're going to walk through the passage just phrase by phrase. But I want to touch the heartbeat of the passage for a moment. Look at verse number 10. Herein is love, now notice the next three words, not that we. Isn't it interesting that 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 little phrase, it eliminates our ability to define love on our own terms or in anything of ourselves. And as we walk through this, notice in verse number 7 it says, Beloved, let's love one another for love is of God. Verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? Because God is love. And verse 10 says, here is where you find love. Not that we, not in us. It doesn't begin with us. Even the love that we experience in our relationship with our God. And I think that's why we struggle sometimes in our relationship with God. Because we try to build it out of our own imperfect and incomplete love for Him. When in actuality, our relationship is built on his perfect and complete love for us. And as we look at the idea, it's bad to try, it's a bad idea to try to define love solely by human understanding. And and when we do that, we especially err when we decide to judge God's love by our own standard of it. When we judge, well, God loves me because I feel love. God loves me because he's doing what I would do for myself if I loved me, if I were God. Because he's working in a certain way or he's doing a certain thing. When we define God's love with our own terms, even he is going to seem to fall short because our love, our concept even of it is broken without him. So herein is love, not that we, not based in us, not judged by us, not decided by us, not even confirmed by us, not approved by us. His love is not defined by our feeling toward him. Love is not first defined by the one receiving it. Ever thought about that? Like uh, when a a mother and a father, they have a, a little baby and it's a newborn and they're holding it. You wouldn't walk into the room. There's love there. There is love in that room. And that baby, there would be different discussion on this one, that baby may have a sense of it, but that baby is not capable in that moment of receiving it, and it's not capable of understanding it. But we don't wait until the child is old enough to receive it and understand it to say, well, now there's love. No, there was love the entire time, a wonderful love, a pure love of a parent toward a child, it's not dependent on the child acknowledging it and appreciating it. That's not, love itself and the relationship is not dependent on that. In the same way, God and our relationship with him is not dependent on me really understanding how much God loves me and then 
receiving it and giving it back to him. He loves me. It's a one-way directed love, regardless of how I first respond. And so if you notice in the passage, and we may not like sometimes what God does or why he decides to do things, and we try to determine what love is, and that's not a good idea because as a human race, we're fairly terrible at it. I want you to notice this morning God's message of love. Let's just, let's just look at the phrases. We'll walk through each of these. You see you have five phrases that we draw attention to this morning, and then we will be done. Notice, if you would, number one, <clears throat> we see God's nature of love, and that is unearned, it is unmerited. Verse number nine, in this was manifested the love of God toward us. And then there's no description of us or our actions or our, uh, our earning or our merit. God loved us because he looked down on us and we were trying hard. He looked down on humanity and we were struggling to figure things out. It doesn't even say that he looked down on us and had this pity on us because we were uh, in needy creatures. God simply had that love directed toward us. Look in Ephesians chapter number one, if you would, and we'll be able to go back and see quite how far back God's love goes. Ephesians chapter one, verse number four. Ephesians one, verse number four. <clears throat> Notice that it says, according, Ephesians one, verse number four, according as he had chosen us in him, Notice this phrase, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. Now notice this phrase, in love. The word, that phrase there, in love, it kind of, it's an overarching description of the whole sentence. God did this action in love. What did he do? And notice, before the foundation of the world, God's love existed for you before you even existed. And that's hard for us to understand and comprehend but he displays this great love because his love toward us is as eternal as he is. It's, it's hard for us to even fathom or understand, but in his omniscience and in his strength, God is so different and greater than creation that he is holy. He is so pure that he is without sin. He is so able and unrestricted that he is all-powerful. He is so wise and understanding that he is omniscient. He is so perfect in his judgment that he is declared just, but just as holy and righteous and powerful, omniscient and pure and just as he is. The Bible says he is love. He was those things, not, not in the sense that, you know, we're, we're, that love for a child is, there's a capacity for it in us. Before we ever even marry before we ever even know that we're having a child and before the child is born and then when the child is born there's this capacity of love and it grows it's there but we don't sense it and know it until we find out joy's gonna have a baby no she i know that was bad she's not in the past i'm thinking joy's gonna have a baby and then i sense that love but i don't really experience it until the baby's there and then ellie and boston and uh, Lex come along and then there's this new sense of love but then it grows as I get to know them and their personality. God's love doesn't function that way. His love is there even in our creation, even in our very forming. He has this great love toward us. John 3.16, say it with me. Why don't, why don't we all say it together? John 3.16, ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting that was great. You guys should just preach a big corporate sermon. We'll do that for the rest. But God so loved the world that he gave his son. We don't understand it. We don't always see it. But the Bible teaches us that God himself is love. He does not display his feel. He doesn't do this because it's just a feeling he has toward us. His love is action, not just feeling. He doesn't offer redemption because he has to. He doesn't offer salvation because someone told him that he must. He doesn't offer us freedom in Christ because he feels guilt about our sin. And he doesn't offer us these things because he becomes a better God by doing it. He offers us these things because he loves us. He's offered us all of this this morning because he is love. And then notice what he did because as we think about Christmas and him coming, notice what he did out of his love. Number two, he sent his only son. And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only 
begotten Son. The words there, only begotten, means of the same form. Jesus is the only Son of God that came, that is God himself. And God himself comes as a human being. God with us, Emmanuel, as we read to start the service. And why, why does love here begin to explode out in this passage? Because God initiates the relationship of love between us. If he doesn't, then we exist completely apart and outside of a loving relationship with him. We can't get to him on our own. We can't earn his love. We can't gain a relationship with him by our actions or by our good deeds. But by grace, through faith and repentance alone, we have that. And how is it offered to us? Because God initiates. Now, I'm not sure this morning, Mallory and Noah, I'm not sure who was interested before the other one or who initiated it, but... There's this sense sometimes when somebody pays attention to you and they display interest in you. And it's like, it's kind of, kind of nice that they initiated that. And then eventually Mallory just asked Noah to marry him. No, I'm just kidding. She didn't do that. <laughs> Noah initiated that, I think. But there's this good sense of love in that God did not wait for us to beg for him. Because the truth is in the wickedness of our heart, we would not do that. You say, well, yes, I would. I would love God. Well, look at the people of Israel. They had God as their direct leader, and over and over they rebelled and rejected. They desired a human king. And when, even when God chose a human king for them, they still could not follow him. He sent prophets. He, sent, he had priests. He had them offer sacrifice. He had direct revelation and messages that he sent to them, and they still rejected him. So there's no way that we go to God without God first coming to us. The Nicene Creed puts it this way. It says, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of lights, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And John says in chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. God, eternal, existent God, came to live with us. The miracle of Christmas is that the baby in the manger was God in human flesh. You see that, number three, that he came into the world. He sent his son not to outer space, not to Jupiter, not to the sun to do some miraculous thing in the universe. He sent him to earth to live in human form. Think of the amazement of this, that God himself lowered himself to have needs, to be born of a sinner, in humble conditions, to have to be fed, to have to be held, to have to be burped and changed, to have to be taught, to be limited in his physical capacity when he did not need to be. He's God of the universe. And yet he displays love by limiting himself and giving himself. Philippians describes it, that he made himself the form of a servant, that he became the likeness of men for us. But notice, it's not just an action. Notice there's, there's some gifts that you'll get, maybe hopefully you all get gifts this week from someone you love or family or friends. And you can get a gift. Sometimes it's almost like this luxury gift. Well, that's nice to have. I'll put it on my desk or... I'll use it once a year or it, use it for Christmas or whatever it may be. And then there's other gifts that you get. It's like you use it every day. It has an actual real purpose and there's different forms of it. Notice the purpose of God's gift. He didn't just send his son as a novelty. He didn't just send his son so that there would be a good Messiah around us. Notice, I sent his only begotten son into the world. Last phrase of verse 9, that we might live. Isn't that amazing? That though we have sinned, God wants you to live. Though we deserve death, he wants us to live. Though we, as humanity, have rejected him from the very beginning, he creates this garden and gives this command, and love is displayed, and we turn away from him. And we've been doing it ever since. We reject him, but he wants us to live. We have formed and we have sought out gods in every other way imaginable. But he wants us to live. And one of our problems is that sometimes we see ourselves as generally good people, even wonderful people. 
Like God should, we deserve what God's going to give us in salvation. Like, like God's going to get a good deal when he saves me because I'm so great. We see ourselves as worthy of what God offers. But it's against that grain that the Bible teaches. But that we are unworthy, but that God wants us to live. He says, I love you. I'll come to you. I'll live with you. I'll live for you. I will teach you and I'll die for you but I'll raise from the dead for you that we might live, notice the last two words, through him. And that's the message of this Christmas is the message of life, that God gives new life, not only in the baby in a manger, but through that baby brings life to all men. Life in the Christmas story is not just in the conceiving and birth of Jesus, but in the life and light that he brings and gives to all who will believe, to anyone, for God so loved the world, that no one should perish, that all should come to repentance in him. And how is that possible? Let's notice with the last, number five, and the last phrase. So God, almighty God, shows his love that he gives and sends his son into the world so that we could live. Well, how do we live through this? Verse 10, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. Notice it, so far, this is very much like verse 9. It's like he's repeating himself. It's almost as if he's saying, God loves you so much that he sent Jesus so you would live. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. So let's phrase it all together. God loves us, and he displays that love by sending his son into the world so that we can live by him appeasing the wrath of God that was directed toward us. That's the ultimate finish of love on this Christmas message. The love of the Father was not only sent, not only in the sending of the Son, but also what that sending accomplishes for us. It brings life to all who trust and believe and repent in his work on their behalf. He's the propitiation. Propitiation, just, it just has the idea of a sacrifice that turns away God's wrath. It diverts it, not by changing its course so that it's lost, but by accepting and receiving it in himself. Jesus didn't negotiate on our behalf and convince God not to judge sin and let it go. Jesus redeemed us from our sins because with outstretched arms and on a cross, he received the wrath of God in his own soul and in his own body on a cross that God himself poured out his wrath on his very own so that all then who would trust and believe can escape that very wrath in which was poured out on Jesus. Jesus came not just to save us from our sins, not just to save us from the consequence and the bad earthly consequence of our sin or the effects of it. Jesus came, and hear me rightly on this, to save us from God. And I don't mean it that Jesus was against God and he came up with someone. This was God's plan. Do you see the love? That God must judge sin in wrath. He is just. He must do this. And so in judging sin, he loves us, knowing how vehement his wrath is toward sin and rebellion against the mighty God of the universe. Knowing that, he pours it on himself to save us from his own very wrath. Incomprehensible. But when we do sniff it even and get a taste of it, it tastes like love. This is what God is displaying to us. And this is why we celebrate at Christmas and we say, I'm so glad that Jesus came. And I'm so glad that he has promised to come again. And in the way that he promised and said, I will come. And we look back to the promise fulfilled. He came. He did everything he said he was going to do. He spoke like the prophet said he was going to speak. He acted like the prophet said he was going to act. He did everything that God said he was going to do. He died like they said he was going to die. He raised like he said they were going to raise. And now he's given us this other great promise and said, he's going to come again. 
and all those that are redeemed in this time period by his love are going to see the world and the universe made right in him. And now we wait for him, absorbed in his love. It's not that we have to sit in guilt and, oh, God saved me, and now he holds this over my head. But rather that he has redeemed us in love, in this mission of compassion. He sent his son to die for our sins, for your sins. Notice the last phrase of verse 10, the last two words. To be the propitiation for our sins. He's not coming to fix someone else's accident. He came because if not, you are going to die and suffer for eternity. Your fault, your sins, your choices, my actions, my doing. Jesus died because of me, because of you, but because God loves us in spite of those things. It's a beautiful display of God's love. And so let's finish finally by just applying it. How do we apply God's truth today? Notice even the next verse in 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, if, if God so loved us, and it, it, you stop there for a moment, and you're just hanging on everyone. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If God loves me that much, that, that God loved me before he ever made me, before I was ever born, before my parents were born, before anyone was ever thought of. God had this deep love, and he wanted to fulfill me, and he wanted to, me to be satisfied by my relationship with him and the worship of him, and in redemption, he wants me to live for eternity in good favor with him for all things, no sin, no hurt. He wants all those, that is love, and he earned that or he brought that into my life by giving himself his only son in death for me. Yes. And now he says this phrase, if God so loved us. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If God loves me that much, what can I do for him? What does he want from me? Notice the next phrase. We ought also to love one another. Man, that, I mean, that is not what I was expecting. I was like, if God so loved us, he wants me to climb Mount Everest and declare it for him. Like if God so loved us, he wants us to conquer every scientific natural feat in the world, go to the bottom of the ocean, go to the top of the mountainsides and put stakes down that say that we love God. He wants us to blaze it into the sky with fireworks and celebration. He wants us to do some amazing feat for him. And in actuality, he says, if God loves you this much, he now wants you to love others. And we don't sense the importance and the desire. God's deep desire to display love to us then channels through this love toward others. So how can we apply it? We first receive God's love. You may be here this morning and you've tried to earn your standing before God. You've tried to get God to love you. You've tried to figure out God. But in reality, what God has for you is the offering of his son who came in the form of man to be born for you, to die for you. And you must receive it by faith, saying, I believe that there is no other way of salvation, that the Son of God died for me, that I cannot fix and earn my way to take care of my sin, but I must repent and turn from it and follow him. And I can receive it. Then we rejoice in God's love. And then we display and share God's love with others. God's love, I said, well, what does that look like? God's love has love with no expectation of return. God's love is active, not only a passive feeling. God's love is not simply reciprocated, it is, originates even within himself. God loves sacrificially. God loves by forgiving. God loves by seeking peace. I ask yourself this morning, do you love others as God loves? It's not just, did you give someone a gift this year? Did you really think it through? Was it thoughtful? Was it kind? But did you love them with no expectation of return? Did you love them in a way that you looked beyond how they have faulted you and you forgave and displayed love anyway? Did you sacrifice? Do you... Give yourself to those around you, your family, your spouse, 
those even that are lost without the Lord in the world that you work with, that you, uh, that you celebrate with, that you're a neighbor to, do you love the way that God loves? Because it would be silly. You know, children do this at Christmas time sometimes, and to no necessarily all fault of their own, but it's, it's neat when kids start to figure out that it's not just about I get something, but I also get to give something. And we kind of try to teach that and train it, but imagine... If a kid does that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 15, 16, and a kid, kid is now a man, he's 30 years old, and he still goes around the Christmas tree, and it's all about what everyone else is going to give him. I mean, it would be silly. He's immature, he's childish, he's selfish, and he's greedy. <laughs> well, what are we if we are Christians who expect to receive God's love but never display it? or not work hard to display it, and not seek to share that with others. May the Lord help us this morning as we think about this, and may while we wait for him to return, may we sense his love, receive it, and display it for the world. Father, we thank you for yourself, for the redemption that you offer in Jesus Christ. We love you, we cherish you, and we ask that you'd help us and guide us today. As we pray, I just want you to think for a moment. Has the love of God impacted your heart, but you have been, you've never received it. We as Christians say that we are saved. Maybe you say, I've never, I don't even know what that means. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be redeemed? What does it mean to have a relationship with Jesus? And if that is you this morning, I'm begging you to not delay. And any service that we're in, we have members sometimes that come forward and pray at the altar. You can come forward and we'll see that someone takes you aside privately and can explain to you exactly how you can know that God will redeem you, how you can know that God's love is received in your life. We pray that you don't wait. It's not worth it. The relationship with God is the only thing in life that fulfills deeply and eternally. So whether you come forward now or here at this altar, you seek out myself or others from our church to know, follow, and seek Christ. Come and see. Or if you're a Christian this morning and you just needed a reminder of the very love of God, that His love is not based in your circumstance or your condition, but that His love is based in Himself. And you've been reminded of it this morning. As we enter this Christmas week, you want to bless the Lord for it. Rejoice in it and commit to display it. Maybe that's you in a moment. You see at this altar and you commit yourself to the very love of God. And we'll ask Him to help us. Lord, help us now as you do a work in our heart. By your Spirit, make it evident to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand, if you would. We're going to sing the song we sang a little earlier in the service. Here is love, here is God, and how he loved us, how he revealed it to us. And let's sing this together there at your seat, here at this altar. Let the Lord work in our heart and life.